Good morning and let me give you a really warm welcome to the church service here at St Matthew's in South Coast Community. Normally we would be meeting physically in the church building with that huge cross that is an illustration of hope of God made man and all that Jesus did through his death on that cross and through his resurrection. We hope that if you're joining us online for the first time this morning, that you will be really blessed and you will know some of that hope that God gives us through Jesus. I guess at this time of year, as we're all anticipating in lockdown two, what can we do during Christmas? We will be able to meet with family and friends. We will be able to go out on those last minute shopping trips. We will be able to go and buy a Christmas tree. All of the things that normally bring joy at the Christmas time, all of them are uncertain. But the one thing that is certain is that lovely phrase in Isaiah, that it's a time of year that we collectively focus on a child being born and that child being God and God is with us. And we see that wording, don't we, on our Christmas greetings. Well, let, let it may be a really strong focus as we lead into this Christmas season, maybe for the first time, or a deeper appreciation of what God did through the virgin birth and through our Christmas message. There's a key focus, I guess, to our service this morning, and that is the importance of prayer and an encouragement to come together to pray. More of that later. And the central message from the sermon in 1 John, the letters of John, 1 John, brought to us by Padzar Vicar, is that he, God, has given us his spirit. What an encouragement that is, that God is with us through his spirit. So if you want to know more about the church, please go on to the website after the service, stmats.org.uk, notices, information, organised events, all of the information is on there and the usual groups that usually meet. You can email us and let us know more about you and what your needs are and you can find out obviously more about us. Let's pray before we hand over to the music team. Father God, we ask for a precious time together. Help us as we come collectively together from all around the Reading community, that you would still our hearts and that you would remind us of your love. Bless this time of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. So we hand over to our music group and we start with our beautiful song, Everyone Needs Compassion.
I don't know about you, but when I hear the word, let's pray, all of a sudden I find myself going silent, closing my eyes, putting my head down and taking myself very seriously. Somehow the phrase, let's pray, has been taught to me to be this sombre affair. But actually, through my prayer life developing, as I've got older and more mature in my faith, I realise actually praying doesn't need to be boring. It doesn't need to be this way that we need to say the right words or do the right things. And when I pray, I need to close my eyes and put my head down and I need to speak in a very soft voice where I say, Lord, in between Lord, every Lord word, or I speak a certain way, or say the right words that are on the screen. See, all of those things would stop me from praying because I'd feel like I wasn't doing it right. But like I said, as my faith has got more mature and I've developed in my prayer life, that means I've developed in the way that I pray, I've realised this one key Thing. Praying is just chatting with God. You see, prayer is our way of talking to God and God talking to us. You see, God, yes, sometimes when we pray in certain ways or we say certain liturgies and it means a certain thing, it is amazing. But actually, the main thing is that God just wants to speak with us. It's like chatting with a friend. Okay, take this for example. I love going for coffee with my friends. I love sitting there in coffee shops when they're open and I love chatting for hours, putting the world to rights and sharing how we're feeling, helping each other through. See, meeting with my friends in coffee shops brings me life. And so when I pray, I just imagine myself there, sitting in a coffee shop with God, putting the world to rights, sharing how I'm feeling and listening to his advice. Because so often when God speaks to us in prayer, he just wants to tell us that he loves us because he loves us and he cares for us because he created us. And when we pray, we open that gateway to speak with him that two-way conversation where I speak to God and God speaks to me. How amazing is that? You have the opportunity to, when you pray, to celebrate with God, to share how you're feeling with God, but also to bring to him those things where maybe life is tough and say to God, God, actually, I'm not okay at the moment. You don't need to be a certain way. You just need to be there with God. You see, we were looking at um, Psalms in the summer and David prays to God through so many different things. David wrote the Psalms and the Psalms are prayers to God. Lots of different types of prayers, loads of different emotions, angry prayers to God, sad prayers to God, sorry prayers to God, please prayers to God and also, wow, amazing praise prayers to God too. You see, when we say to ourselves, we don't have to pray in a certain way, it's only about meeting with God, all of a sudden we are free to have a fulfilling and fruitful prayer life with God. Talking relationship with God. Chatting with our friend Jesus. So I've got a song to share with you now and this song is all about praying. It's a really, really fun one. Now this is the School of Prayer. Now these students thought that praying was boring and normal and you had to do it in a certain way but then when they realised that they could pray in any way they wanted to, they were liberated and they were free in the way that they chatted with God. So have a watch of this song, hopefully you will enjoy it and dance along too. So I hope that you get inspired by this song all about praying and praying to God. Enjoy. Oh 
stop us now Nothing keeping us down Anytime, any place, gonna pray anyway, anyhow There's no stopping us now Nothing keeping us down Anytime, any place, gonna pray anyway, anyhow Don't need a list of special words Don't need to be perfect to be heard Thanks, Martha, for a really fantastic family time together. And uh, Martha has started to develop that really key focus uh, to many of our lives, the importance of prayer. It's, it's that communication mechanism that God has so richly blessed us with, whereby we can like pick up a phone and speak directly to Father God in heaven. And the Bible says that Jesus's ministry continues in an ongoing way, that he hears our prayers and present them, presents them to the Father. There's a wonderful opportunity for us to encourage each other at the minute through lockdown. Every night of lockdown at 7.45, for 10 to 15 minutes, people in the church are coming together to pray and to sense the things that we should be praying for each day. I have personally found it a huge encouragement as I've joined together with other folk in the church to pray. And it reminded me of this verse in Exodus 35 and verse 21. And everyone who was willing and whose heart moved within them came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of the meeting, for all its service and for the sacred garments. And he goes on to talk about the types of things that the people brought. They, it was gold and silver and food, materials, and in a sense, they're metaphors of what we can bring to God in prayer. And I love that phrase in another version, their hearts were stirred. And I really hope that the Spirit is challenging you today. Why not give up 15 minutes on most nights in the week to come together and join with us to pray for each other? It reminds me of some cardiac physiology. You see, the, the, the little cells in our heart muscle are lined up almost like a Mexican wave. And as one cell starts to excite 
that starts the wave of contraction that causes a heartbeat, it excites the next cell. And it's a bit like that in corporate prayer. When I listen to, uh, say, Jan praying, or I listen to David praying, or Pat's praying, it excites me and it causes a response in my heart. So please think about joining us for corporate prayer in that every night opportunity through lockdown and be encouraged. Before I hand over to Paul, who will bring our formal time of prayers, and then to Julie, who will bring God's word, 1 John 4, verse 7 through to chapter 5, verse 5, uh, I want to pray. And then after Julie has finished reading, Pads will bring our sermon to us. Father God, thank you for the gift of prayer. And we want to bring before you now the things that we have done wrong, the things that have caused distance between us. Help us, Father God, to know that you have died through Jesus and dealt with once and for all our sin and our wrongdoing, regardless of what our minds may think. There is no separation between us and you as long as we repent of our sins and with our mouths say Jesus Christ is Lord and Saviour. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that it is through his shedding of blood that our sins are forgiven. Forgive me for the wrong thoughts and actions this week. Forgive me for the wrong attitudes or behaviours. And through this time of confession, we pray that you would bring us right into the presence of you, Father God. In Jesus' name, Amen. And Paul continues that theme as he leads our corporate prayer together, followed by the Lord's Prayer. And Julie, reading God's word, handing over to Pads to bring his word to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope and the joy that you inspire in our lives. You and your son Jesus Christ represent the hope of nations, the hope of eternal life and the hope of spiritual peace. Even in the darkest moments, our prayers provide comfort and support, guidance and strength. In this difficult year, this has never been more vital, and we give thanks for your word and inspiration during this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that the real, renewed hope of an effective vaccine for COVID-19 will mean that we can emerge from the darkness, the isolation and the despair of a world that has been gripped by the pandemic. We pray, however, for those still suffering or for those who have passed away from COVID and all those who are unwell from all causes and for those suffering from depression, anxiety and uncertainty over what the immediate future holds for themselves their jobs, education, or their families. We pray for those in the National Health Service and the care home sector for the incredible challenges they face at this time during the winter months in the front line of caring for the health of the nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for leaders of all countries as they try to balance health concerns against economies and livelihoods. And we pray for our own Prime Minister and government as we seek to strike an enduring Brexit deal with Europe and forge a new partnership with a new administration in the United States of America. We pray for the Queen and the Royal Family as they continue their role in uniting the nation and symbolising a spirit of unity and determination at this difficult time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for community and togetherness and the hope for a family Christmas. We pray also for St Matthews and for future decisions that will shape this church in a post-pandemic world and for new attempts to reach out to the congregation with the introduction of live streaming services. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please lift up to your hearts today and in the forthcoming week, those in the church bulletin who are in special need of our prayers. Gathering our thoughts and prayers together, we end with the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The reading today is taken from 1 John 4 verse 7 to 1 John 5 verse 5. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is, made, is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves must love also his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, church family. And thank you, Julie, for reading our scripture this morning. Let's just pray before I begin. 
Lord, I pray that you would come by your Holy Spirit, that you would help me to speak, and that you would give us all ears to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, in a world of great uncertainty and confusion, which it certainly is right now, it would be really good to be absolutely sure of the things that matter most, wouldn't it? As I was preparing the talk on Wednesday this week, I was asking the Lord what it was he wanted me to say to us through today's passage. And if you're a regular reader of the Bible, you'll be familiar with the experience of every now and again as you read God's word, a particular verse or phrase jumps out at you as if it had been highlighted by one of those fluorescent highlighter pens. And as I read prayerfully through the passage, this is the verse that stood out to me. And it goes like this. This is how we know that we live in him and he lives in us. He has given us of his Holy Spirit. And as I meditated on that verse, it grew on me. And all kinds of questions started flooding into my mind. Questions like, how do we know we have the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit essential for Christians or an optional extra? What does the Holy Spirit actually do in our lives? And many more questions besides. Theologian C.H. Dodd says that this verse, the one I've just read, and the three that follow it, are the high watermark of John's entire letter. So why don't I just reread those four verses again, and then we'll dive into what they're trying to tell us. <clears throat> this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. In those four short but wonderful verses, there are some hugely important and deep statements about Christian belief. But John Stott, in his commentary on this letter of John's, helpfully simplifies it into three tangible ideas. A gift, a confession and a transformation. So, firstly, the gift. Verse 13 says, God has given us of his Holy Spirit. And you know, I think that over the long history of the Christian church, there's been much confusion about the Holy Spirit. Who has the Holy Spirit? What's the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives? I've known genuine believers who've come to be really worried because either they thought or someone else had implied that they might not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Perhaps because they never had a dramatic spiritual experience of the Holy Spirit or because they didn't speak in tongues or some other reason. So let me clear the decks of any uncertainty or confusion surrounding the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Because the good news is that the Bible is absolutely clear about this. Every Christian in the whole world has the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Let me say that again. Every Christian in the whole wide world has the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. How can I say that so confidently? Well, because on very many occasions, in many different books and letters, the Bible tells us so. Here are just two examples. Firstly, from the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. When people asked the Apostle Peter what they needed to do to become followers of Jesus, he replied, repent and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you repent and put your faith in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. Full stop. Nothing more is needed. There's no examination. <laughs> Trust in Jesus and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Here's a second one from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. He writes, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So again, when a person believes in Jesus, they are given the Holy Spirit. The Bible never says you have to have a dramatic experience or that you have to have any particular gift of the Spirit in order to prove that you have the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Christian author John Piper says, it's really important to understand our spiritual condition before we embraced the Christian faith. Because if we understand that, then we'll understand why, if we're a Christian, we have the Holy Spirit. He points out that before we were spiritually dead, that's in Ephesians 2, that we were unable to receive things of the Spirit, that's from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we were unable to please God, that's from Romans 8. So if that was our condition, how then did we receive the Holy Spirit? And the answer that he gives is that it was a miracle. It was sovereign grace. God's grace sovereignly applied to us in our helplessness through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? And his disciples say to him, oh, well, who then can be saved? And what does Jesus say? Does he say, well, you've got to be poor or you've got to be good or you've got to be generous or something like that? No. Jesus says what's impossible with man is possible with God. In other words, none of us by our own desire or wish or work can enter the kingdom of heaven. But God in Jesus has done it for us. John Piper asks again, are you amazed at the sovereign grace of God that you wake up every morning as a believer in Christ? Are you amazed? True saving faith is the number one evidence that you are born again, that you have the spirit. And later on in our passage, John writes, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And that means born of the Spirit, possessing the Spirit. That's the amazingly good news. If you believe, then the gift is yours. God's gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing, a gift, the Holy Spirit. The second is a confession. In verse 14, John reminds his readers that he was a direct eyewitness of Jesus's life, death and resurrection. He says we, which clearly includes him, have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the saviour of the world. And he goes on in verse 15 to say that if anyone acknowledges this fact, in other words, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Isn't that a wonderful promise? And what's more, it reinforces the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. If God lives in us, then that can only be by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people think that one is conditional upon the other, that we have to confess Christ in order to receive the Holy Spirit. But it's actually all one and the same. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 that we cannot confess Christ without the work of the Holy Spirit in us. So do you see, again, faith is the sovereign work of God in a person's life. It's nothing to do with us. It's all to do with God. I remember some time after my conversion experience in South Africa 20 years ago, telling one of my newfound Christian brothers 
how the Holy Spirit had come upon me in that little church out in the bush and that six months later I would finally confessed Christ as Lord. And he was adamant that it couldn't have happened in that order, that I couldn't have received the Holy Spirit until I had confessed Christ. But I assured him that I had. <laughs> John 3 records Jesus telling Nicodemus that the wind of the Spirit blows wherever it pleases. God is mystery. We can't put God in a box. My life changed forever from the moment God's Spirit came upon me. It was nothing to do with me. It was all to do with God. And so John tells us in verse 14 of our passage, if you acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, then God lives in you. In other words, the good news is you have the Holy Spirit. So don't doubt it. Don't allow others to make you doubt. And that brings us to the third aspect of these verses. So number one, we have the gift, the Holy Spirit. Number two, there's a confession. Jesus is the Son of God. That's our confession. And finally, we have the result of the gift and the confession. And that is the transformation. We are changed to, as John says in verse 16, to live in love. I love that expression, to live in love. That's the transformation. That's the real outward change which comes about when the Spirit dwells in us. And the Bible has so many ways of characterising this change. It would probably be impossible for me to list them all in this talk, but here are just a few. The Bible says that when the Holy Spirit of God comes to live in you, you are a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, writes Paul, he is a new creation. Another one. You've been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of God's precious son. Another one. It's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. Or once you were dead in your sins, but now you are alive in Christ. And there are so many other examples. And the really, really good news is that this is not just theoretical or theological. This transformation is evidenced in our lives. Before you knew Christ, before you had the Holy Spirit, you were basically selfish. Now, that doesn't mean you weren't a nice person. <laughs> I'm sure you were. But you weren't living for God and his kingdom. You had yourself on the throne of your life, not Jesus. I certainly know I did. Before God caused my faith to come alive, I lived for me and for my family. But my worldview was basically selfish. I could not have imagined 25 years ago that I would ever foster children or pray with murderers and rapists in prison or deliver food and clothes to the poor or visit the elderly, the sick and the dying, or invite my mum to come and live with us. But please hear me, this is not me, but Christ who lives in me. That's how we know we're alive. That's how we know we're converted. That's how we know we have faith. That's how we know that the Holy Spirit is in us. None of that would be happening if the miracle of God's Spirit were not at work in us. This is not well done pads. This is well done Jesus. <laughs> and I see him in all of you. I see him in your passion for prayer. I see him in your desire to serve the poor. I see him in your wish to fellowship with one another. I see him in your sacrificial service. I see him in the way you care for and love one another. I see him in those who volunteered to help Southgate Primary to serve disadvantaged families. I see him in the way you long to be able to sing songs of worship to him once more. <laughs> in so many ways, I see the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in his people at St. Matthew's. And I give thanks to God so much. 
You know, one of the reasons I meet up with more than 30 Christian leaders every Wednesday morning to pray for our town is our common desire to see this kind of transformation spread through our communities, through our workplaces, our institutions, schools, hospitals, colleges, businesses. And that's the reason why about a year ago we changed the name of our group from Reading Christian Network to Transform Reading. Because we wanted to name the vision that we have for our town, to see it transformed by the love and power of Jesus. And what we do, besides meeting to pray, is to try to connect all of the many Christians and churches and Christian organisations so that we all get to realise how the small but important part that we each play in God's kingdom work is just a piece of a much larger jigsaw. And so over the coming weeks, I'd like to show you some very short glimpses of different ways in which God's people in Reading are helping to bring transformation to the lives of so many in our town. I'm going to start with one close to my heart, which is Home for Good. Here it is. My name is Bethany Hare. I am a project worker for a Christian charity called Home for Good. A lot of the time I'm speaking to people who are considering fostering an adoption um, and sharing what the process is like and also going across churches and saying what the local needs are. So currently in Reading there are 270 looked after children so I say what that means um, and explain that actually that's 270 children not living with their families who have experienced trauma um, but how the love of a family can uh, offer that child stability and permanence and change their outcomes. It can be a challenging role but also really rewarding. I start the day by praying and saying right God where do I need to be today? What, what, what am I doing today? Um, and I find that conversations I have over the phone are just at the right time, speaking to churches, and they're saying, yeah, come and talk. Locally, we've had three churches who have set up support groups, which is a great safe place for foster carers and adopters to come, support one another, um, and have fellowship together. I feel really excited about being part of the bigger picture. A lot of the children who end up in care can end up in the criminal system, mental health issues, and churches do so many fantastic things to support them at that point. And the work that we're doing is trying to get that early and um, ensure they've got a home that's going to support them and um, them not to get that stage. So. Do you see how God's Holy Spirit dwelling in Bethany has given her such a big heart for the children who have no families, nowhere to call home? That's just one example. And over the next few weeks, you'll see many more aspects of how the Holy Spirit is bringing transformation across our town. Because I want to encourage us and open our eyes to the big picture of God's kingdom work in Reading. So I really hope that this word has encouraged you this morning. And if you had any doubts before, then know this. If you believe and confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then God has given you his Holy Spirit. Don't doubt it. Believe it. And I pray that you will be filled to overflowing with the love of God because Romans 5 5 tells us that God has poured out his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. So let's help to make sure that the love of Jesus shines more brightly than ever this winter and this Christmas as we take the transforming power of his love out to the world around us, remembering that it's not us, it's all him. It's all by his grace that we believe. And it's his grace that's all that's needed. Amen. Your grace is enough. Let
Wow, well, what a great message for all of us this morning. That God has given us this a most amazing gift, the Holy Spirit, and how the Holy Spirit, through living in us and through us, can bring blessing to ourselves and to our own lives, to our family, but to those that we come into contact with. And that's a lovely image of God's church, a community of ordinary people, uh, being able to do extraordinary things because we love and live and serve an amazing God. And his Holy Spirit is there with us every day. And what a, an amazing thought. It takes us right back to the beginning of the service when I was uh, asking you to really think about the preparation time between now and Christmas. And that focus that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the heartbeat of the Christmas message. And let's really appreciate that as the Son of God, he loved us and gave himself for us. And because of that, we can live in the love that John writes about in his letter to the early church. What an amazing thought. And what beautiful worship songs to be able to celebrate that with, that God's grace is enough for each one of us. And as we focus on that, let's say the grace together as we bless each other and set each other up going into a new week of opportunities. So may the grace of God be with you now and forevermore. Amen. And give that blessing through the week and maybe I'll see you at 7.45 for corporate prayer and the opportunity to excite each other and really appreciate what we can do as church in blessing the South Coast community. Bye for now. And don't forget that Zoom post-church sessions are reinstigated at 11 a.m. straight after church and there's a link on the website or in the newsletters that have been circulated. See you in a bit.